And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, and talk about all the fun, fantastic things going on in the world of Linux, at least the things that we found a little bit interesting. I am Vin Stone. That um, and impervious giggle, that's it. That's I'm going to change your, <laughs> the impervious giggle uh, is one Jill Brian and the man phoning it in from Britannia. Hello. You know, you love him. Pedro All Mateus. the way across the world. Across the pond. I was like, that's not how ponds Aww. work, morons. Uh, <laughs> yes. Ponds aren't salty. Be quiet, Amy. Uh, <laughs> and everyone joining us live. Uh, how's everybody doing? We got a bunch of fun things to talk about this week. Some a little ooky spooky, but uh, oh. some kind of surprising and fun. Uh, yeah. Jill, you, you, yeah. Uh, did you just finally quit? Did you have enough of your students? You're like, I'm out. Aww. Peace out. Quality. <laughs> Yeah, so it's now the end of the semester of my animation class, so we're out for the summer, and I'm like, I'm going to enjoy the summer, but I do miss my students also in the summer as well, but they keep in contact with me, and I've been having fun finishing my pink broadcasting rig. That's been a lot of fun. It's nice to take your time and just enjoy the process. <laughs> And we've been also, I have been also counting penguins, and you will find out about that, so stay tuned. <laughs> Pedro, <laughs> you're a little sad. You had to get rid of your laptop. I did. Uh, the Dell XPS I had for work, uh, my boss is like, yeah, we need to give that XPS to one of the directors in uh, one of the other sites. It's like, what happened to the previous laptop that person has, like? Well, they dropped it and then ran it over with their car. It's like, I don't want to give them my XPS. <laughs> That's, no. it's just, they're just going to break it. No. <laughs> oh, poor Pedro. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I I had to do that. It's basically just plug it into one of the docks, re-image it. It's like, there you go. Take it. <laughs> hey, Aww. I I had a very fun experience about reading RTFM, man do that every now and then. I don't know about you, everyone listening. I, I consider having to read instructions failure, incompetence on my part. It's like I, I have really exhausted every possible option. Like, all right. <laughs> Where's the, I, this, this genuinely happened with the Threadripper X399 motherboard. Put everything together, had it all, and I, I knew that I, I was eventually going to, have, you know, to hook up the you know, LED front panel headers, but I couldn't find them to hook them up. This is way back when I spent five minutes it's like I am not looking mm. in the manual to do this anyway. To the point, the back to the thread rubber, the Noctua has. Uh, I wanted to put the fans in a push pull configuration, 140 millimeters. Noctua doesn't play around, man. I did that, cut it on. It made one of those horrifying, like something's wrong noises, not grinding, but like something is amiss. Turbulence between the two fans, and it turns out like this massive pamphlet that they have. It was oh, quite boy. massive. Way over on the right side, <laughs> uh, it was like section nine, subsection three, appendix Q, uh, sub appendix. Ha ha, we buried this information here. <laughs> there's like extra bumpers and a, like a resistor thing in a certain. Con there's one particular way to do this where it doesn't make a horrifying noise. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay, that's the thing. I learned something. Anyway. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, outside of that, that, that's my week. There's a little TIL for me. Uh, what do we have? Let's get into it. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about we Dells. Have, uh, speaking of Dells, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, we do have the Precision 5540, 7540, and 7540 Developer Editions, uh, new from Dell, a uh, next generation of Ubuntu-based Precision mobile workstations. Uh Good news, right? Dell's, yeah. Dell's oh. been doing a bang-up job with yes. uh, delivering, because if you're thinking options, you might go, oh, System76. Dead second would be Dell, or if you, you know, Enterprise, anything. Dell, right? Yeah. Dell, yeah. Uh, doesn't Lenovo also do Linux versions? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. everybody does a Linux version if you're brave enough, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you could just straight up get the laptop and do your own linux version oh <laughs> but it's uh but, yeah no those are those look really nice and the one that they have at the top of the article looks exactly like that xps i had to give up 
Oh, sorry. Keep, keep, keep going. I, I'm enjoying no. that. <laughs> Suffer more for this. <laughs> well, you know, Bart and George has been like Venice. Ven said has been nailing it with Project Sputnik and putting a uh, Linux on all their laptops. It's really, really awesome. Awesome. And I've been very impressed with the starting price points of these, uh, which range from a. Uh, uh, 1,100 to 1,400, depending on the model. And even um, the entry-level Dell Precision 3540, which was released May 1st, starts at just over $700. I mean, that's actually amazing. That's a really good price point to find that you can find a, a, a Dell Precision for under $1,000 to start. That, that yeah. is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is one thing I'd like to see though, because okay. uh, I know it's coming. They 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 said it was coming, but I'd like to see some Ryzen's. Yeah, <laughs> uh, give us you know some eight core Ryzen laptops. This is true. I mean, especially yeah. when you consider if you want to do all the um, apply all your security patches and disable hyper threading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't need to worry about you know having sixteen threads exposing you to. Eight different mm -hmm. Spectre variants yeah. plus Fallout plus MDS plus a uh, yes. bunch of other things. Everything else is going on, but um, yeah, good on Dell. I mean, five plus years of doing this. And hey, you can get it preloaded. You get support. It's pretty easy sale, especially at work. Good on them. Yep. Hey, everyone was really excited about Chrome and a new feature they're going to soon enable. Oh, yeah, they were so yeah. excited. And of course, especially the fine folks currently developing uBlock Origin, which basically became the de facto standard for uh, just ad blocking plugins everywhere. Uh, and their GitHub, someone started a thread. It's like, okay, Google is doing this thing. And uh, there's one of the comments that uh, one of the developers does a very good job of explaining everything that uh, Chrome is doing. So basically what they're mm -hmm. doing is they're going to change how the API that controls uh, the loading of certain web elements, uh, they're going to fundamentally change how that works. Why? What the hell, Google? <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, Google just picked up some reason. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to change what uh, elements get loaded and... Um, what um, certain uh, pages are allowed to show or not. And the way that it used to work, it used to be that uh, you could block an ad entirely without uh, the... Um... What's going on? <laughs> Nothing? Um, the Without the ad even loading in the first place. And now they're changing that, that it... The ad still loads, but the rules will, you'll be able to set rules to not show certain elements in a given page. And that's not making people happy, especially when you take into account the fact that Chrome has a limit of 2,000 rules currently. They say that they're going to increase that, but by how much, we don't really know. It really, so, I mean, when you think about it, this, this has been well known this has been something that's coming and google yeah. is definitely doing everything well, alphabet whoever however you want to roll that has been a spinning this as a security thing and i guess maybe at the end of the day somehow with enough mental gymnastics you could make that case however um a very valid point and you block this but only people who i mean google's an ad company they they want something and, you know you don't hear um like ad block you know who have like the recommended or the pass pass through ways like give us some yeah. money and we'll let your approved ads show up they don't seem to have a problem with this um because they're already using this new mode yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> you know chrome definitely won that market share that it got by being a better product i mean you might not want to admit this but at the time firefox was junky it was bloated mm -hmm. it was slow mm -hmm. it was not a good experience for anyone you can pretend it was but we both know your line um however you know, they, Chrome definitely has the lion's share of the market right now. They went from like, ah, look at this silly thing Google made to Google's taking over the web 100%. But you can lose that just as quickly, Google, as Microsoft, how that works out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are, Jill, like you're going to say, man, 
There's valid yeah. alternatives, especially with Quantum, with Firefox, right? Yeah, with Firefox, especially in the last uh, uh, year and a half or so. They've really improved. And I actually run all my blocking ads on Firefox. And I've actually been using Firefox more these days. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah, I like to run all those plugins. <laughs> And that's one of the things that Chrome never really did. It did get a lot yeah. of extensions and a lot of plugins, but Firefox yeah. was always the dominant platform in that respect. You want yeah. a plugin to do anything, chances are there is one for Firefox. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Ad blocking is and then data mining, you know, as soon as you realize like anything you type into the search bar on the Google goes back to Google even if you like yes. start backing it up. To me, I was like, yeah, I've already, I've already made that deal. Like, that doesn't bother That's me. That's fine. We all right. have Android phones, right? <laughs> yeah. The, um, <laughs> right. But, you know, we have alternates, you know, even with Chromium Base, you're going to have Brave and you're going to have Vivaldi, which I'm currently yeah. running both of those right now in conjunction Brave. with Firefox. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that this is going to be interesting to see how it pans out, I think. I know. It it is going to ruffle a lot of feather, a lot of feathers, and it's already started to clearly. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing, you know. How much control should we be giving Google for mm -hmm. for this? <laughs> All of it. We got to show you the ads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Van. Like you were saying, I mean, you know, they're going to repeat the same mistakes that Microsoft made. They they got to be very careful and tread very gently. Listen, this is just the end of Battlestar Galactica that never <laughs> happened. This has all happened before and it will all happen again. This is a natural cycle for any company to go through. But, yes, it's true. Yeah. Okay. That was, you know, we wanted to talk about that because it's kind of about Linux. This most definitely is about Linux. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So this is Krita 4.2. This is one of my favorite open source digital painting applications, which, and they've just released the new version 4.2 after almost a year of development. Over 1,500 bugs have been fixed for better stability, and there are so many new features. I, we can't even mention them all. You'll have to go and read the article. <laughs> but one of the major ones is the color palette Docker has been rewritten. It is much more flexible, and you can reorder swatches via drag and drop, or you can group swatches as well, and you can change the number of columns and rows in the color palette. And that's, you know, one of the most dominant tools, of course, in the painting program, because you're painting with colors. And so that's very important that they added that flexibility. And they also support GIMP color palettes that can be imported. And uh, one of my favorite features is a new animation. Python API has been created. And as a result of that, there are two new animation plugins, one for loading a video for reference and importing frames to your document, and the other for managing sprite sheets for game developers and animators. That's nice. And it, yeah, that's uh, and, and they work really well. I was playing around with them. They work really well. And there's what's another huge uh, awesome update to this version is much faster drawing with procedural brushes. And there's been a 50% 50, 50 increase in speed of drawing because Krita is now utilizing multi-core CPU processing. Yay! Yay! It took him a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's just some of the new features. Please go and read, read the article and, and download uh, the app image. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> and Krita is one of those bits of software that they're really neat. And I wish they would get a bit more adoption because you need someone yes. who actually needs mm -hmm. a tool like this professionally to come in and say, okay, we need this, 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 and this. <laughs> and they'll be, yeah. they'll, they'll be told to go die in a fire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that will happen, I most likely. Just, yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that will happen. But I really do hope more people start to look at it as like, okay, that could be a thing, but it needs a bit more functionality in this area and this yes. area. Mm. And, you know, in turn, make it so that people are willing to fund the project a bit more because they are mm -hmm. getting some funds and they have in the past um they had that bit of uh, tax issues uh that uh i think it was private internet access that bailed them out yeah so kudos private mm -hmm. internet access uh but yeah it's um it's a really nice tool i mm -hmm. want to see it's it amazing. developed 
Yes. Definitely above my pay grade. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Gimp, I, and I, I, I can speak finally... speak as someone who has yeah. Nori here. <laughs> yes. You know, um, designed <laughs> hey, by proxy. I, I'm switching my students to Krita <laughs> and Gimp and all the open source tools. So, And they're really enjoying Krita because it, it has some functions that Photoshop doesn't even have. I'm living that Inkscape lifestyle. <laughs> I, I like that because I hate myself. Yes, Inks, Inkscape is great. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it is old blender level UI. <laughs> it's like what? Okay, it's a great program. I'm just saying, user interface UX yeah. can use a little bit, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I think we went a whole week without you um slagging off on GNOME, Pedro. Uh, <laughs> Are you sure? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not 100. percent We might have to go back and double check. That. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, this one is actually a positive thing. Uh, honestly, if there's one thing that GNOME needs is better performance and anything that the developers can do to improve on that aspect, by all means. And this is uh, Georges Stavrakis, or uh, I don't know how to say his name. That's the best I could do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he, um, he posted a little video about uh, using uh, sysprof which is a system profiling tool that basically it captures everything that the window manager is doing and it profiles how it's be, uh, uh, how it's performing, how long does it take, how many resources does it consume, so on and so forth. And he just goes through that for a couple of seconds and then at the end of the video you can actually see him go through everything that he's doing uh, and how long it took, if any frames were dropped, if any frames were missed. And uh, there's the score there. And it's, uh, that's good. That's really good. But if there's one thing you really don't want your end users to touch, and clearly GNOME, GNOME is very much focused on the end user experience because out of the box, it doesn't mm -hmm. let you touch anything. So you're supposed to use it as is. So that as is experience needs to be very important. And don't even mention profiler uh, tools to your end users because that'll get them running for the hills. This, but this yeah. genuinely looks like a, a gang of things that I instantly disable. I'm like, this is wasting valuable CPU resources. Why are you wishing? Why are you failing? Thing. You can't. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah you uninstall it. And XFCE. Use it. <laughs> yeah, it, it works pretty well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just have to use a completely different desktop environment. But yeah, no, they're working on performance finally, I think, ever since uh, GNOME 322 or 324. Yeah. When that mm -hmm. first came out, it's like, okay, we need to focus on the performance now. People have been complaining, and it was slow. Ever since 3.0, yeah. it was really <laughs> bad. It's getting better now. I have it running on the um, X230, mm -hmm. and it does, it is smooth. The, the, the animations, as you saw, like the uh, opening the um, app drawer, that does work even on an old um, quad core mm -hmm. 30. 450 i5 i think it is mm. so yeah it's uh it's good it's positive mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah well i think this is great for showing the community how this prof is being implemented implemented to debug benchmark and test the speed of gnome development and this should help tremendously enabling code to improve gnome and you know it puts it out there in the community hey this is how we do it and uh, maybe you can help <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone who has. This is how we do it in your head now. <laughs> this is how we I'm do it. <laughs> One hundred percent. Okay. Uh, booga booga time. Hidden Voss. Oh, Malware. Linux. One. Oh no. The oh world's yes. Burning. Um, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, I think our theorem dropped this one in our notes. This is from. Yes. In Tezer. Dot com. All this is going to be in our show notes, so don't worry about it. Look at that big spooky wasp. Evil, evil. And wasps serve no purpose. Uh, they give a pretty in-depth overview of this latest little bit of ooky spooky malware that has infected Linux systems. And really, they, one important thing, the reason I threw this in here is you can check if your system is infected by doing, you know, just a search on your LDSO files. Because if any of the files do not contain the string etc ldso preload, your system may be compromised. I mean, this malware is still active. 
has zero detection rate, and that's with all major antivirus systems, which I lo- like a lot of you. I'm like, wait, what? Antivirus? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I guess that, <laughs> yeah. that is the thing I know about checking for rootkits and stuff like that, which is, is uh, it does contain code from, um, what is that? Mirari? Mari? Or if you want to Mirai. say that. Mirai and Azazel. Mirai and Azazel. Mm. Those are rootkits, so they found some of that business in there. However, Pedro, like... This article, like a lot of other ones, this is the reason I go through these. I'm like, wait a minute. So how do you get this? How does this infect the target system? Yeah, that's the big question. And (laughs) this article and all the other ones uh, that we've seen over the past, I don't know, three or four days that this has been out, they have failed to mention anything about the... Uh, like the exploit that got this into the system in the first place, or if yeah. this is uh, in any way capable of doing that initial uh, exploit or infection, as it were. Hmm. But none of the articles mentioned that. And I found one article on ZDNet, of all places, <laughs> uh, that actually says this is a stage two malware. This is the payload that the initial exploit dumps on a machine and then it stays there stagnant and basically tries to hide itself as best it can uh, from whatever is running on uh, your system. And then it starts deploying rootkits and starts trying to actively target other machines in your network that may not be as protected. Uh, And yeah, this is stage two. It only affects anything after the system was already compromised but i guess Mm -hmm. it's not good shock value you don't get as good an article title from stage two malware found on linux no 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 it's much better if you have like new linux malware found escape detection from all known antiviruses (laughs) well this is a very valid point i mean like this is something you could track interview what what if this only shows up if you have physical you know access yeah. to a box and it's like this is not even a story and what's something to look out for but if mm-hmm. this is something you can get over a network then you're like yeah well maybe yeah if maybe this is over like a WAN, you're like oh, okay then a remote get- exploit then this would be huge it would be yeah. the biggest remote exploit since when was the last remote exploit on linux i don't know man it's been a minute <laughs> It's been For a while. while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just wanted to give that a mention. Just uh, be on the lookout. Ooga booga. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't, don't type in Pretty your much. password, kids. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't just copy paste stuff off the internet into your terminal. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to level with you. Have you been frustrated enough where you blindly start doing that? Yeah, <laughs> I think we've all done that. <laughs> I'll do that if I see, okay, this is this command and this does this. All right. I'll look at the command and I won't bother researching if I know what it does. But if it's a new command with like a new bit of software that I've never used before, it's like, what does this do to Google? <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes not. I've definitely been mad enough. I was like, I don't care at this point. This box is getting reimaged. Um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah that is a valid strategy as well (laughs) just nuke and pave (laughs) like it's either gonna work it's gonna work one way or the other a little bit of news about uh canonical and the goings on from mark shuttleworth indeed Mm -hmm. and uh this uh mark shuttleworth gave a big interview to the computer business review and you know cbr being what it is it is very much focused on the business side of things so if you're You know, not too much into the business. This interview is going to be a little bit boring. Uh, But uh, there are some very good uh, and some very poignant questions uh, posed to Shuttleworth. And he does actually does a very good job of putting a positive spin on it. I don't know if he's being honest or not, but he does a good job of making it. I'm just worried about this pie chart. There's Ubuntu, there's Linux, (laughs) then there's Debian. Yeah, there's Linux, Ubuntu, and then all the other Linuxes. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, he, uh, one of the questions was like uh, about open source software and how the licenses affect everything. And he says that uh, they publish a lot of open source, uh, but nothing 
the, conveniently, his answer doesn't mention anything about, you know, contributing back to the project that they've based their entire operating system and cloud infrastructure on that they don't contribute back to. Yeah, they, they, he forgets oh. to mention that. Uh, but it, that stuff's mm -hmm. important, Mark. Just say it. <laughs> but yeah, it is a sizable interview and uh, I'll pass it off to Jill because uh, yeah. you highlighted a quote there. <laughs> yes, uh, most definitely. Um, actually, Mark Shuttleworth did a lot of re really good. Uh, it was very a very thoughtful interview. And uh, one of my favorite quotes of his was, lots of businesses that are longstanding VMware and Red Hat customers are now signing up with Canonical for a new for new projects. They're not doing a rip and replace. They're not throwing the other guys out. They're just essentially preserving that as at this stage while growing a new Ubuntu estate. And I thought that was really well put because as we know, a lot of, a lot of the companies are using multiple versions of Linux for different functions. And Ubuntu yep. is really growing. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I know what Ben's going to say. <laughs> Homeboy talking smack about uh, Slowaris. Don't talk bad about Slowaris. No, 100%. Um, he does bring up that, you know, he's like, if you want to know why some people in IT still long for the days of Solaris, uh, see, I'm going to do it now, Solaris instead of Solaris. <laughs> These are also the same people that are going to be dealing with, you know, HBOX, OS 400, and variants like that. Um, it's because it worked. It still does work. Good. Well, very good. Um, mm -hmm. It's called enterprise, man. You know, it's definitely a realm where the mention of like clouds or, you know, moving fast and breaking things will get you busted down to the help desk, if not thrown off the top of the building. Yep. That's just not how that mm -hmm. rolls, you know, and you're looking at yeah. like Red Hat, Oracle, IBM, they got that unlock enterprise a hundred percent. I mean, that's what I walk into, you know, no, nothing against like we're doing everything in the cloud and Ubuntu. Canonical's doing a good job with that stuff. I mean, that's yeah. where their market focus is, but it's an apple and wrench comparison, you know, and it's like, yeah. wow, of course they're going to keep the stuff that their, you know, company is based on this <laughs> mission critical. It's like, oh, they're not ripping that out. It's like, no, no. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he also, th uh, or uh, I, I was going to say throw, uh, through some shade, but it wasn't so much throwing shade as it was, well, people rely on Red Hat because of OpenShift and the uh, the Kubernetes implementation and everything else mm -hmm. that Kubernetes gives you. And he's like, yeah, but uh, you load up a Linux system and Kubernetes, you load that on top of that, and all of a sudden it's free. You don't have to pay for the Red Hat license. So are you saying that the cloud implementation of Ubuntu isn't going, requi isn't going to require payment? Yep. Is that what you're saying? Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know. I, I now speak on behalf of Shuttleworth. You didn't know Clearly. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's doing his thing, man. I mean, you know, it is. I I, I got nothing but love for Canonical. I, I got a lot of love for Shuttleworth because that's somebody mm -hmm. that cashed in around twenty six, well, like five hundred million dollars, and. Instead of like, yo, private island, whatever, like what 99% of everyone else would have done. It's like, hey, man, I'm going to try to make Linux a thing. I'm going to try to turn yeah. it to a desktop. I'm going to start a company. And this company is going to do moonshot programs. We're going to try to make phones. We're going to try to make our own X server. And you need companies like that. They got to yeah. they, they, they gotta do the wild stuff and have the financing to do it and the people to do it and the talent to stick it all together. So, Yeah. That's what I think about Canonical. I know, I know a lot of people like Pedro. It's like, oh, I'm going to hate on him. I'm like, nah, you, you keep doing I you. I hate on everyone. <laughs> oh, no. So, talking about Canonical, trying to make the Linux desktop thing, ZDNet, um, you know, t take your best shot, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the last best shot. Steven's back. With Microsoft cutting off support for Windows 7, the Linux desktop may finally get a stay in the sun. But are Linux companies ready to take advantage of their opportunity? Oh, oh yes, the Linux companies, the one that stocked the Linux <laughs> store down there on Linux Street. Check this out, Brad. I'm going to say Linux has been a perfectly serviceable desktop for probably well <laughs> yes. over two decades. You know, it's 2019. <laughs> if you ask me, not an unpopular opinion, um, 
the battle for desktop TM is only being fought by a select few online, kind of us, you know, desktop PC users, and our voices will be heard. Because, you know, if you haven't noticed, like, the desktop as itself, as a whole, is kind of a lost thing. It's dying art. Um, it's, it's not the future. I hate to say it. And yes, I will have mm -hmm. to pry it from my own cold, dead hands, but... You know, it's, we're going to see the convergence, man. I mean, it's going to be that single yeah. device. It's going to be your mobile, whatever. I don't know if it's going to be holographic socks that you will communicate with, but <laughs> the, yes. Socks. Yes. The, the very concept of having a monitor, having a tower and sitting in front of that and using that for your computing, that's going away. So, mm -hmm. well, some of the diehards will keep like the monitor set up and maybe an external GPU enclosure, and then they'll get home, take their phone out of their pocket, put it on the dock, and all of a sudden, uh -huh. there's a computer. <laughs> That's cute, yeah. Pedro. They're just going to use their TV, which is going to be 8K. <laughs> yeah. Some people will have no, they TVs won't. as TV. well. <laughs> all TVs. <laughs> Shuttleworth told me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I, for one, I, for one, am of the opinion that, yes, the, like, the idea of convergence of having your phone be your computer, and you come home, you plug it into a dock, I'm going to be one of those people, just keep two monitors, drop the phone in with an external GPU enclosure, boom, it's my gaming computer now. Uh, I want that. Stadia. That's the dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the dream. And you're definitely going to have that. Like right now, you're thinking like the immediate future. You're thinking maybe a decade out. I'm talking 20 years out. Even Microsoft's like, yo, you want support for Windows 7? We're going to stream that to you. Yeah. yeah that, that's how We're that's going, going to going give to you Windows 7 as a service. Right. Yeah. It's going to be use cases. Like general computing is done on mobile devices today. That's the average person. That is their computer. It's in yeah. their hand. And it's yeah. a tablet. It might be their TV. It's not, they have a tower desktop from the 90s with a 14.4 modem. And I'm like, yeah, I have a computer. Look. Uh, <laughs> I haven't turned it on in 20 years. Right. And it, yeah. it's a difficult thing to hear, especially if you're somebody watching this show and you're like, this is madness. And I'm like, no, this, that, that's normal people. We got a bubble going on. Yeah. And <laughs> that's yeah. going to be going away. So I, I don't see, this is like pouring tons of research. We can even go back to Canonical going. Hey, we're going to make something that works with touch and all that. Even Gnome yeah. was like, yeah, let's make this work with touch. Little, little ahead of the uh, curve there because yeah. it, that hasn't gotten to the point. But, you know, even people on Linux, the side of, like, yeah, we, we see where this is going. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not keyboard and mouse. I don't like it any more than you. I mean, that's just, that's, that's going to boil out. Mm hmm. So I don't know if that's necessarily a war we need to continue fighting. Just use XFCE. It's never going to change. 50 years from now, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, if we're talking desktop environments, I'm going to say Cinnamon, KDE, and Budgie. Uh, you know what? That sounds like a good case for Mint. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> 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 yeah, so this is, oh boy, this is uh, a, a really controversial article at the right right now. Um, uh, James Sanders of Tech Republic says that Cinnamon makes more sense as a distribution agnostic pack package. And he also sta states that persisting in maintaining Linux Mint as a platform to showcase Cinnamon makes no sense when the labor of maintaining a distribution is handled better by Ubuntu, Foto Fedora, SUSE, and Arch, among a select few others. And, you know, I, I, I disagree and agree at the same time with this. I don't think a, a Linux distribution needs to be deprecated just because it's, it created a unique desktop manager, such as Solus with the Budgie desktop, Ubuntu Mate with the Mate desktop, and Elementary OS's Pantheon desktop. But I do understand that it would make it easier for the devs and Clem, the main developer at Linux Mint, to just focus on Cinnamon and its implementation in other distros. But, you know, Linux Mint has a lot to bring to the table. Uh, they have a wonderful fast installer. It's actually the fastest around of all the USB live installers I've used. It is the fastest. 
And the Cinnamon desktop has an easy-to-use Windows-like interface, and Linux Mint is one of the distros that I recommend new users to, to learn Linux on. And it ranks third at DistroWatch. DistroWatch may not be accurate, but still is very telling. So I think there's still a place for Linux Mint. But I think Pedro disagrees with me. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> but then again, I'm the negative Nancy here, so... Yeah. Oh, uh, sweetheart. The... <laughs> but yeah, no, to your point, Jill, I don't think anyone was making the point that, uh, you know, Solus is just a showcase, uh, showcase for Budgie or anything the sort. Uh, that is more of a secondary point that the article was saying. It's like, Linux Mint as a distro it doesn't really have anything going for it anymore. It used to be, it's like, okay, you're a Windows user, you want to try Linux? Go with Linux Mint. It set the codex out of the box. It had a layout, uh, even back in the old GNOME 2 days, it had a layout that was very similar to Windows. And a lot of the stuff was in, you know, the places where you'd expect and everything looked familiar enough that someone who was only ever used to using Windows could easily, it's like, oh, okay. And you could start learning that. But as time went on, uh, the Windows desktop paradigm changed and Linux Mint stayed the same. And then GNOME 3 came out and they decided, you know what, let's make Cinnamon. Great idea. Cinnamon's an awesome desktop environment. It tries to do uh, similar things to what Windows 7, uh, like the Windows 7 desktop did. Uh, and it does that reasonably well. But out of the box, the experience with Linux Mint, at least for me, has been a buggy one. And it doesn't even give you like the advantage of having the codecs pre-installed anymore. It's like... Oh, so it's basically just you bun to it a theme using cinnamon. Okay, I don't, uh, I don't see the point in it anymore, to be honest. Oh, positive Pedro. All right, what, 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 <laughs> you know, you got to think about this, and I've said this before. Back in two thousand and six, uh, Mint was legitimately the new hotness. It was it's like, oh, it was the arch of its day in the popularity. And like with all new hotness, it, it, it's kind of faded away. But as Pedro pointed out, uh, it definitely made a point because it was shipping Flash and it was shipping your multimedia codecs, something that even Fedora does now. But it, uh, Fedora, come on. Fedora tries to make, try, tries to make <laughs> you feel Dude, it tries to make you feel bad about it. It always has. <laughs> They're never going to just like, oh, do you want to send the bad ones? It's like, yes, you mean the ones that work? Yes, those. Uh, 100%. Uh, Cinnamon, as you said, you know, definitely a neat desktop, albeit completely and wholly inferior to XFCE and Mate. Uh, but it it was created as a response to GNOME 3, which was a bit of a nightmare, especially on day one. Yep. When basically, because GNOME 2, I used GNOME 2, and it's like, that's good enough. Everyone like, used GNOME 2. Yeah. It was the most popular desktop environment of the time. It was it, good. That was like the only time I let go of it. I was like, yeah, this works fine. I can do because it it's like, okay, I don't have a problem with it. But, you know, I don't think we need to write them off just yet because like over on their blog, um, the... You know, they did a total of, what, $24,000 in donations, uh, making it their biggest month ever. And that's pretty good. On So I, I don't think we need, we can write Mint uh, off as a thing. People like it. People love it. Yeah, there's a lot of people who will defend Linux Mint. And chances are you've probably seen that video with the uh, orange backgrounds, like, stop hating on Linux Mint. Uh, and I want to live a life that is, I, I want to be fortunate enough to where I, I actually want my life going so well that something like is a legitimate <laughs> issue that I'm going to complain about is a Linux distribution. I am yeah. envious <laughs> of people with that type of time and just everything. Going, yeah. yeah. I don't think I've ever been as committed to anything as these people are to Linux mint like kudos, but. Really? <laughs> well, you know, this is this is Linux, man. I mean, the you know, a lot of people like you, you can definitely get into Linux. Don't don't make a distribution like, you know, you can make it part of your identity. Like uh, that's fine, but don't make the distribution you use the most interesting thing about you. Don't defend it like that. You know? Yeah. Think about it a little bit more. But uh, hey, beautiful people, 
we do have to pay the bills actually. And we're not going to do that by telling you to buy things. So why don't you buy some things over at, uh, <laughs> no, uh, I just want to mention this, like we mentioned last week, if you're looking for everything that pick it up on UAG or whatever, well, we put a little thing together of all the hardware we use to make the show because people were asking about that. I made a list and it's detailed and I'll tell you about everything. And, uh, we do got a little bit of news, Jill. We, we actually have something with weekly daily Wednesdays on it. We have LWW shirts and I'm sure mugs will be coming soon. Nope. And <laughs> Ben. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have mugs too. Come on, Jill. Do you want to do any other products? <laughs> oh, because I oh. I got older, then, man. Come on, bring it. Okay. <laughs> I'd like LWW hoodies too. <laughs> we got a gang of stuff though. Yeah. Uh, we got a face on a shirt, Pedro. That is uh <laughs> that is a shirt that will get bought as well as a hoodie and one of the uh pink uh Hell Elks mugs for Nori because she liked those. No. Yeah, the strawberry the... Hell Elks. <laughs> I, I would just say you this is kind of how I broke it down. And I was like, okay, Pedro, hey, Pedro's like, ah, face on shirt, neat. Jordan, wholly indifferent. I was like, yeah, whatever. Me, he's like, this is the only shirt, the only merchandise in that store that I do not own, nor will I. (laughs) I am wholly against, I will, no, I don't even want that in the house, man. Hopefully, hopefully you do or something like that. I don't know, but uh, that's cool. Thanks everybody, um, LGC (laughs) Merch. And now you can have the weekly daily Wednesdays t-shirt. It's just the classic. It's plain. You'll never see it on a hoodie and or a cup. Uh, <laughs> yep. Never. Vince being mean. Not being mean, man. You, you, you're the one dooming products. I'm, I'm, I'm doing damage control. I'm like, ah. Uh, <laughs> but it's got awesome. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Uh, 118 beautiful party people making all of this possible. Not just this show. Our big show on Saturday. Our streams on Tuesdays, uh, Thursdays, and Fridays. We're going to be getting together this Friday for some Jackbox. Come hang out. Is that we uh, do it? Uh, we got a couple of perks for everyone who joins us on Patreon up to and including access to the Discord. And uh, we do a pre-pre super shows in our production meeting that you can come hang out with an hour beforehand on the audio stream on LGC FM, which is available through the Discord. I actually had somebody ask me, Maybe there's a little bit of confusion with this. It's like, I don't want to install a program. It's a web page. It's Slack that has the ability to let people know if you choose to what video game you're playing. <laughs> think of it like that. This yeah. is how you think of Discord. <laughs> but we also have IRC, irc.freeno.net. Come in there anytime we uh, are live. And we're definitely jamming in that. But hey, man, thanks everybody for making this possible. And a big extra thanks to every one of you uh, who are sharing the show. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. Take a yeah. minute to do it. I always do it when other people are um, doing their business. And because, you know, that's how we let each other know. It's like, hey, maybe you like this stuff. And they're like, no, and that's, that's horrible. How dare you listen to stuff like that? It's not a direct contribution, but that's actually one of the things that helps the most. It's because yeah. you, yeah, you know about it, but, you know, your people who follow you on the social medias may not know about it and they may enjoy it. They may not. So let them know. Put it yeah. in front of their well, that's faces. That's the whole, like, one of the reasons, like, <laughs> all of our t shirts and stuff like that are not like $27 because we're not trying to make money on that. That's like, hey, man, I want people to genuinely get confused. Like, what's that about? And you have to explain it, not me. Um, <laughs> good luck with that, mm-hmm. beautiful people. Thanks again. Keep being awesome. Yeah. Uh, slice of pie. Boop, boop. Yay. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. picture. Fancy towel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, someone took some care and love in that one. <laughs> so I'm, this is something I was really uh, ec- excited about. And I mentioned at the top of the show, you can help save penguins lives by counting penguins for Penguin Watch. Penguin Watch is now working with the World Wildlife Fund and British Antarctic Survey and this is an incredible project using Raspberry Pi Zeros with Raspberry Pi camera, the Raspberry Pi camera module that takes 
photos and time lapse of penguin colonies along the Antarctic Peninsula. Peninsula, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Everyone's oh, yeah. allowed one Jill. <laughs> if you're okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> if you're watching the pre pre super uh, pre show, uh, Pedro Challenger just appeared, son. Uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least I know how to pronounce peninsula, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So all you have to <laughs> have to do to count penguins is is go to the Penguin Watch website, which is in our show notes, and a random image of a penguin colony is displayed and you then label and click on the adults, chicks, the eggs and the other animals and um it counts them for you and that that helps the scientists. And um one of my favorite quotes in the article is uh, by counting the penguin, the birds in this in their colonies, users help penguinologists measure changes in the birds' behavior and habitat and in the larger ecosystem, thus assisting in their conservation. And, you know, this is, can also help scientists understand how the penguins are being affected by climate change and the potential impacts of local fisheries. And it's something fun and easy. Um, I created a an account and have already counted several hundred penguins on multiple images. So it's a really fun way to help save the penguins. <laughs> penguin clicker, the game. Penguin, yes. Pe penguinologist, <laughs> man. That, that's, a, yeah. that's a title. That's going to confuse yeah. you. Don't, don't show up at a Linux conference and tell anyone I'm what a... you do for a living because... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone yeah. will look at you is like, are you making fun of us? What? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. HK Cam. What's this? Never Indeed. heard of it. Uh, so, uh, speaking of Raspberry Pis with um, uh, the camera module, uh, this one is, mm -hmm. well, it's mm -hmm. a home security system that was built as cheaply as possible and the. Um, Original developer, yeah, it's very yellow. Uh, the original developer mm -hmm. even uh, created not just the uh, base resource files for the 3D prints, but he's also offering to sell them. Uh, he's based in Austria, so uh, if you spend more than 30 euros and you want to have it shipped in the US, it won't cost you any extra for shipping, which is great. Uh, it's a bit less uh, if you're in the EU. Uh, the no idea what's uh, what's it going to cost to run it on um, to the UK currently, but we're still in the EU, so maybe that still mm -hmm. counts. But yeah, it is just a Raspberry Pi with a camera module, uh, and it's yeah, it's a teeny tiny little uh, remotely accessible camera that's running on the Raspberry Pi that's inside a little case. Yeah, there. it uses Raspbian and support HomeKit. Yeah. Yep. So you got an app yeah. for it. And yep. That's that's that could be useful. Oh, it, definitely. It is genuinely useful. And, and mm -hmm. we need more people doing stuff like this, not just useful stuff, but you know how we usually talk about it's like, oh, this really involved project, but you need to source out these parts yourself. Well, here we have someone with the resources and the capability to actively ship uh, all of the stuff that you need everywhere in the world. <laughs> we need more people doing that. This is 100% true. And I like the fact that it's yellow because you can set it up in your house and the next time somebody's over at your house and I'm like, <laughs> what's that? You can go ring, 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 ring. Yeah. Gam, gam. <laughs> then they'll look at you with disappointment like they often do and you'll continue on with whatever. Yeah. 100%. Uh, okay. Heater meter. <laughs> that's what it is surprisingly <laughs> something we didn't name that sounds, sounds like one of our projects uh open source barbecue controller i wanted to throw this in because uh last saturday in the uh pre-show um chat realm was having yeah. a little bit of a barbecue <laughs> off 100 mm -hmm. like i'm making barbecue I was like no i'm making more barbecue and you know <laughs> if you've ever spent like the weekend knee deep in marinade yeah, pro tip, don't get kidnapped by cannibals, kids, uh, especially ones that possess a heater meter technology because it is a rather nifty open source controller for your barbecue. And it's built around the Raspberry mm -hmm. Pi. And this is what it like made me happy. Like right here, very much unlike Machete, it texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is really cool. <laughs> the technical part of me is like, okay, this is neat. 
I'm down with that. The other part's like half the fun's hovering around and having people bring you alcohol while you cook. This is this is how you get me to cook. By the way, <laughs> um, <laughs> keep me plied. You can bribe with booze. Ben with booze. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's how I end up being the one working working the grill. And I, a lot of people, I don't trust not to kill themselves with undercooked meat. Um, <laughs> this is pretty cool. Like you know, you you could use it for hot dogs, right, Pedro? Mm -hmm. Just steak. Just, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get the ideal temperature that you could drop a steak on the grill for like 20 seconds, flip it over, 20 seconds, done. Next. What? No, you <laughs> cook a steak in a microwave like a normal person. No. I hate those people. <laughs> I also, you can't talk to them because they're still chewing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you with your lazy steak eater. <laughs> trying to burn calories man uh that's a neat project i again I mean, any any excuse to bring your love of technology together with your love of playing with fire because let's face it that's yeah. what barbecuing is it's like oh i can play with fire <laughs> yay it's like squirt lighter mm -hmm. fire. <laughs> propane and propane accessories hey maybe you want to tell us about how you enjoy uh mixing your love of linux technology and fire how could you do that <laughs> Well, you can do that in a multitude of ways. Chances are we're going to be talking about one of your stories, if you do. But if we don't, and you uh, still feel like those uh, charred eyebrows are worth a mention, you can go to LinuxGameCast.com, uh, hit the contact button, fill out the forum, let us know exactly uh, how you managed to, uh, I don't know, burn your pinky toe. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll be more than happy to feature it. Is that a challenge? Sure. Pinky toe <laughs> burning challenge. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make that a thing. <laughs> make me like the internet enemy number one of the week. Yeah, Aww. you know, I could see the internet violently reacting to the pinky toe burning challenge. <laughs> Now, I know that some people would actually do it. But I'm yeah, sorry, I mispronounced. Form, I meant to say care. Uh, what? <laughs> contact form. We yeah. got a thing. Uh, be careful. Our, I am still dialing in our spam bot, and uh, you might run into that. Just be, you know, don't try to offer us uh, like jewelry and uh, <laughs> jet rentals. Keep that out of there, and it won't tell you that you're a naughty spammer. Okay, <laughs> Adam. We we were talking about Nvidia. Yes, mm -hmm. last week. Well, like Nvidia is a thing. It's okay. It's not entirely evil. A little bit evil, but uh, Adam had a different thought on it. Pedro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, someone made the point that it's like, oh yeah, like the, all of those open source games that you're playing with your by somebody Nvidia. means me. Yes, that's the thing I regularly <laughs> say. <'Cause it's laughs> true. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, to that point, uh, Adam says, um, I don't mind proprietary games. You can wrap them in fire jail with the dash dash net none flag to keep them isolated. Uh, proprietary blobs generally can't access the internet, with some exceptions, so I don't mind them either. I just don't like NVIDIA's proprietary drivers because they're a pain in the ass on some of the weirder things I do on X. It's like, okay, uh, expand on the weirder things, because now right. I'm curious. <laughs> hey man yeah technically correct the best kind is like, you know you can't go anywhere with it you're like i do some weird things that they don't work with okay oh, no right. uh, you know use cases use case. very very specific yeah. use cases sure but you explain i, I want to know exception doesn't <laughs> prove the rule and yeah. I, it, I i always have to go down like the Open source versus closed source, because I'm not like, oh, my God, everything needs to be. Pro no, not at all. You know, I, everything <laughs> we do, like up to including how we stick things together, I put online because I want more people to do it. And the best way to do that is to tell them how. Um, but hmm. the one is like, well, proprietary. It's like, well, what about your CPU? How, how deep do you want to go? Do you want to go full metal Stallman on this? Because you can buy a completely open source hardware stack and a yeah. laptop. Uh, um, Lenovo X220s. <laughs> this is this is a very real thing, man. And so that's why I'm like, as long as it works on Linux, I'm down with it. Also, yeah. <laughs> also, I'm gonna say in general because there are apparently weird things to do on it. I, I want to know because I want to <laughs> play with it. Um, but 
the just, just quit saying it was like NVIDIA. If you're talking about laptop drivers, I got you, fam. Optimus, I, I feel you on yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Optimus is a different thing. But for desktop, since the days of 3D effects, man, and that rolled into NVIDIA, we're talking in the 90s, early 2000s. NVIDIA support hardware accelerated support has been painless on Linux. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pedro, am I wrong, Jill? Am I wrong? Yeah, it's been Not painless. Really. Mm. Uh, the only weird thing I can think of even suggesting is um, if he's trying to test Zynorama, because Zynorama does work better with the open source drivers than the NVIDIA drivers. But that's never you know, worked I, properly anyway. Yeah, it's never, <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going to say. It's never perfect on either one, but it does seem to work better on Mesa than it does the proprietary NVIDIA. <laughs> That's cool. I just like things to work. I mean, pick up AMD. I mean, this I, I'm really genuinely curious as to see what Navi's going to uh, bring to yeah. the table. I mean, it could give me a good option to yeah. uh, roll with that. And apparently NVIDIA's like, yeah, we're just going to release some more cards too. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to refresh yeah. our current lineup and call them super. Super. Thanks there. for asking the card. <laughs> 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 oh man, we're not going to do any better than that. So we need to get out of here, roll some credits, and I think everybody better show it up. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Maybe. Yay! Do I have credits? Maybe I got credits. There they are. There could be credits. <laughs> Schrodinger's credits. Hey man, there <laughs> Until will the be credits, credits show up on screen. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Thanks, Squeaks. <laughs> Thank you, our lovely chat room. Darren Foxy Andrew, Atomic Mike. Ah, oh, man, that's as far as I got. I tried oh, to. I took producers. Swing. Nathan Veritanuda, Simcha, <laughs> Arthurin. <laughs> Texas Man, he North Ranger, up, Igor, like, Mir, hey. Jake, Vladir, Colin, Ryan, Scott. <laughs> You're just making things up, man. <laughs> Steiner X Vendheim. Hey, yeah. stick around for the intro of the producer version. M. Because Langston. I spent two Mr. hours Lert. making that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you spent Yay. two hours rendering that. <laughs> also, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Love you. <laughs>